all, this is Dr. Mubin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So depression is a serious mood disorder. It's a common illness. And there are patients who have major depressive uh, syndrome and uh, they are treatment resistant. This study that I'm going to show you today, it is from Britain. Very interesting study. It is about the transcranial magnetic stimulation of the brain, which actually ends up causing modulation of the brain neural networks. Although it did not, uh, it was not efficacious in 100% of the patients, one third of the patients responded. But what is interesting is that there were patients who were treatment resistant for depression and they became, they achieved remission. And for six months, that was a follow-up time for the study, they stayed in remission. This is a huge deal. And the second thing that was interesting was that another 20% of the patients, they had, they had reduction in depression or they felt better and they kept feeling better for six months. So let's look at this uh, study. If you just wanted to hear one line summary, it is transcranial magnetic resonance, ma magnetic stimulation of the brain that allows the brain pathways to become modulated, to become balanced and reduce the depressive symptoms even in drug resistant depression or treatment resistant depression. So let's look at it together. <clears throat> so this is drbean.com. If you are interested in more lectures like these, or if you're a medical student or a, med a healthcare professional, nursing student, you can get your access at drbean.com. There are CEs and CMEs available as well. So with that, here is the study. Connectivity guided intermittent theta burst versus repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation for treatment resistant depression, a randomized control trial. This is the study, we'll discuss this. There is some supportive links as well to understand a little more for your reading, <laughs> for your homework. So let's start with my drawings. So first, <clears throat> important concept to see for this study what they were what these researchers were trying to achieve was an understanding between two different methods of providing transcranial magnetic stimulation one of the method is called connectivity guided intermittent theta burst versus the other one is called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. They both have a, a difference between them and that difference is that this one, connectivity guided, is a little more advanced, it is computerized and what happens is, if I can just quickly, what happens is that imagine if the, uh, if the beam has to be focused on a tissue here, then in the repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, the patient has to come back and sit in the exact same place in the chair and there may be a head uh, structure that would go to keep the patient in the same, same place so that the beam is focused on the same tissue with every session. So of course that creates variance in where the beam goes because the exact uh, place cannot be measured every time. This connectivity guided system, actually this is a computer that looks at the nose of the person, the ear of the person, and then decides where the beam should be. So its variance of, of place is very, very uh, precise or less. That is the basic difference. So the researchers were trying to see the difference between these two technologies. However, in that process, they saw that there was no difference between the two technologies. Both of the methods actually helped with the depression. And now let's see what did they find. So <clears throat> these, the method, the RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, it is an FDA approved process in the US. It was approved in 2008. 
It is also approved in UK. It was approved in 2050. Now, this is a diagram I took from this uh, study. I usually draw my own diagrams, but this was important one. So thanks to the study and credit to the study. So here, if you see these dots, the black dots, is where the beam was focused, or these are the spots where the beams were trained. However, if you see these white dots in here, this one and this one, these are where generally the beams are trained to. So this was the re repetitive transcranial magnetic simulation, and this was CGI-TBS, which was a newer computerized system. The other important thing is this area, right anterior insula, and this is the place there. What you will see throughout this discussion is a talk between these two systems and this, this uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation balances out this talk and improves it. And, and when this talk is, my apologies, when this talk is abnormal, and I'll explain later, then that is when a patient has depression. So depression can have other reasons and other pathologies as well, but one of the association with depression is abnormal talk between these two tissues. So here, very quickly, uh, to summarize it for you, so that if you just wanted to watch five, 10 minutes and then understand what's going on, here is what is their uh, uh, abstract. They said it's a large, adequately powered trial. And they actually discuss an, another number of trials, which are small trial trials. So this is a large, adequately powered trial from the UK using TMS, and ITBS for treatment resistant depression. And they observe the outcomes or any improvements for 26 weeks or for six months. They actually say that both treatments were similar. However, check this out. For both treatments, one third of participants showed a response. So please, once again, remember these are uh, Two third of the patients here in this uh, study, they were moderate to severe drug resistant or treatment resistant depression patients. So one third of them responded. Then one fifth achieved remission. One fifth, 20% achieved remission. And one fifth demonstrated a sustained response for six months. The results are encouraging given that two thirds of the participants were closed as medium to high treatment resistant depression, classed, I said closed, classed as medium to high treatment resistant depression that is approximately equivalent to failure to respond to four or more antidepressant with a long, long duration of current depressive episode, median six years. So these patients were in this state for a long time and they were taking many, many drugs and even then they were not responding very well. And then out of these patients, one third responded. Then they talk about this is the study. Participants were randomly assigned to 20 sessions, 20 sessions over four to six weeks of either technology one versus technology two with resting state functional MRI at baseline at 16 weeks. Resting state and functional MRI is that you ask a patient to be in a resting state, you're not asking them to do anything, and you take their MRI to see what are their connectivities within the brain, what areas are lighting up, where is oxygen being used, what is the brain's resting state. So they say that MRI, Neuro-navigated CGI-TBS and RTMS were equally effective in patients with treatment-resistant depression over 26 weeks. So the basic thing that they wanted to prove that one is better than the other, that they could not prove that both were effective, but what they showed was great results. 
So I want to show you the conclusion, then we'll go into the detail for how did they do this study. In conclusion, the study found that CGI, TBS, the new technology, and MRI, neuronavigated RTMS, the existing approved in use technology, are equally effective and safe. Patients showed clinically substantial improvements in depression that were sustained up to 26 weeks. These findings raised the possibility that some treatment-resistant depression patients unresponsive to other treatments could be kept well, while many others would derive clinically significant benefit from one or two MRI navigated courses of 20 or possibly more sessions over a year. So this is it. This is the summary that approved method, both in US and UK, 20 sessions, a session is about 30 minutes, and the patient developed sustained well-being for up to six months. So now the question is, what did they do? What happened? So I want to make sure that we understand this. There's a common myth that depression is in a person's head and they can somehow become just okay by themselves. I remember when I used to get depressed, my parent who was uh, raising me, he used to say, go pray and you'll be fine. And I still, to this date, I'm 54 years old now, to this date, I cannot understand what did that mean. Maybe there are some very mindfulness or better meditation techniques and that would have helped me, but I just did not know them. So depression is a serious and common disease and should be taken seriously. So let's look at this, that what they did. Antidepressants and psychotherapies are effective for moderate to severe major depressive disorders, MDD. However, a proportion of individuals with MDD have treatment resistant depression. So do you know how many? So imagine that these are all depressed folks. 33% of the individuals under psychiatric specialist care, 33% under specialist care and 22% in the primary care failing to respond adequately to two trials of antidepressants. 33, one third almost, or more than one fifth one third in psychiatric specialist units and 22% in primary care setting are resistant to trials of two antidepressants. Now what they did was they had this uh, magnetic resonance imaging. This is extracranial. It is, it is not invasive. It is a device which is outside the brain and then it focuses on the brain and sends magnetic waves those waves cause modul neuromodulation or they take advantage of the brain's capability of neuroplasticity or to change. And they actually change the neuronal circuitry functions. This is an amazing thing. So the Bright Mind trial, so this is their trial, was multi-center, parallel group, double-blind, randomized controlled trial. It was double-blinded. Patient didn't know the end and the therapy. Uh, the people who are giving interventions, they didn't know. Our primary clinical hypothesis was that RSFMRI, uh, the CGI-TBS, the mo modern technology, based on effective connectivity from the RAI to the LDL-PFC, so RAI, right anterior insula. Th that is a part of the brain tissue. I can't put that correctly. You saw that in the beginning of the diagram somewhere over here. And then the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and a tissue somewhere over here. So these two tissue are the ones that they're talking about. So RAI and IDL PFC. 
uh, sorry, LDLP of C, would be more efficacious in reducing depression symptoms over 8, 16, and 26 weeks compared with structural MRI neuronavigation or RTMS at the standard stimulation site. So this is what they wanted. So here, <clears throat> now is the important part. Just a few slides, but please pay attention. Our brain, your brain, my brain, our brain is, of course, a uniform tissue, but it has functional networks in it. It has certain neurons working together in groups to perform certain functions. For example, we have neuronal areas for speech. We have neuronal areas for hearing. We have neuronal networks for smell and sense and touch and pain and pressure. We have personality area in which we have executive area, central executive network or CEN. Now this central executive network is important for us to keep an eye on today. This is what is the left. This is what they were working with. So left uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. That is part of the central executive network. What is the central executive network in general? I mean, this is a complex area and there are so many functions, but generally part of the personality and part of the decision-making, part of the outward, outwardly things. So right now I'm teaching, I'm doing something outward in the outer world, and that is through the central executive area. You are listening right now and reacting in some way that would be also outworldly. However, if you are right now thinking something <laughs> or if you are internally, if you have an emotion because you're talking about depression or if you have remembered something and you are just sad for that reason, there are there is an in inner world and the processing of that as well. The inner world processing is done by a, another network of, of uh, neurons, which is collectively called default mode network. Default mode network or DMN. So now we know that there is a CEN, central executive network. There is a default mode network. Then there is another which is called salience network. So here, this little thing that I made, <laughs> this is salience network. Salience network, if you can see here, it is doing a daydreaming. Uh, salience network, as the name says, salience, it, it makes you aware of the salient events around you. For example, you are going in a busy street and somebody calls your name. Now, out of all the activity and the noise and the talks that are happening around you, your brain has to filter out that one voice and alert you that your name is called and maybe even connect for you that who is calling. And not only that, then help you perform a response as well. To say, okay, <laughs> we should respond to this person and say, hey, hello, how are you? Or we should just run away or just ignore. So this is a salient event. There are many events that are happening around us, but some of them are important to us. These are our salient events. So there is a network of neurons whose job is to filter out the salient, the important events, and then to make you aware of them. Not only that, then to create an emotional state about them. Not only that, then to provide you help to create a response for them salience network. This insula, so I've made it like this over here, that insula, the, the structure, the right anterior insula that they were talking about, insula is part of the salience network. Now, in this whole diagram, the couple of things, the couple of networks that I would like you to remember is the central executive network in the prefrontal cortex, and the salience network in the insula. So if you see here, the brain 
can be subdivided into networks of regions that serve separable functions and brain connectivity changes as detected by resting state functional MRI can individualized neurostimulation therapy of MDD. So TMS stimulation, so transmagnetic, transcranial magnetic stimulation of the ideal PFS, this guy, the, it is part of the central executive network. This alone is not the whole network. A key node of the central executive network may modulate key nodes within the salience network. So did it just very quickly become complex? So let me back up for a second. They are saying that if you do the transcranial magnetic stimulation, what it does is it causes this structure which is part of the central executive network to be stimulated. When it is stimulated, it causes in turn an effect onto the insula or the insula is part of the salience network. Now, why are they talking about it? Because you would see in the next diagram that these two networks are really important in patients who are depressed, these function incorrectly. So what is their function? So here, let's say this is the executive network. And I, I turned their eyes towards each other because I didn't know exactly how to draw them on the side. So he's looking there and this guy is looking here, right? Both of them, the prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and right anterior insula, they both talk with each other. They both have connectivity with each other. When they are connected to each other, imagine that they are sending nerve impulses. This tissue is sending impulses here. This tissue is sending impulses here. So I want to give you one more important key sentence to keep in mind. If the central executive network is dominant, then there is less depression. If for some reason, the salience ne network becomes dominant, if the right anterior insula is more dominant in working with this or sending more dominantly impulses to the prefrontal cortex, then that is associated with major depressive disorders. And these are the, uh, in some of these patients, not all of them, in some of these patients, even three, four drugs over years do not work. And what is the basic pathology you're seeing? This tissue is more dominantly influencing the prefrontal cortex instead of the other way around. So hopefully this one message is taken because I'm going to now use that in the next discussions. Here. So normally what happens is, so if you see here two terms, anti-correlated and uncorrelated, what does that mean? What that means is that these two tissues, central executive network, prefrontal cortex, less left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the right anterior insula, they are anti-correlated, meaning when one of them works, the other one becomes silent. When the other one works and this one becomes silent, they are opposite to each other. They're, they're functionally, if one is more active, then the other one is less active. If the other one is more active, then this one is le left. That is one possibility in healthy, non-depressed patients, persons. The other possibility is that they are uncorrelated. They have no correlation with each other's function at all. They're not connected with each other. They're not married to each other at all. One is independently doing its function and the other one is independently doing its function and that's about it. No binding with each other. This is healthy, non-depressed individuals. Now, in those individuals who have major depressions or treatment-resistant depression, they are observing. 
So once again, let me back up for a second. There may be many more reasons for depression. We are just looking at one part, excuse me, but an important part because when they train the transcranial magnetic stimulators on these parts, then they have reduction in depression or alleviation of depression. So important parts. Now here what you're seeing is that they both got connected to each other. They both are now positive, positively correlated to each other. One goes up, other one goes up. One goes down, other one goes down. That is observed to be an abnormal pattern and seen in depression patients. So how did they, how did they put that? They said, if independently confirmed, TMS-induced restoration, restoration of the normal CEN-DMN anti-correlation pattern may be putative mechanism of its antidepressant efficacy. So they're saying that when we do this resonance stimulation, it breaks their link with each other. It actually causes neuroplasticity. It changes the neuron's behavior. And these neurons that have hitched with each other, that are positively correlated to each other, they become modulated. And they go back to this kind of a behavior or totally uncorrelated. And as soon as that happens, the patient becomes less depressed or not depressed. So they're saying that this is the putative mechanism, meaning this is presumed mechanism. They're assuming this is the mechanism because when they give the transcranial magnetic stimulation, they, these two regions, they break away from talking with each other in a positive correlated mechanism way. So they're seeing these observations. So then they're making assumptions to say, maybe this is how it is working. And they said that more studies are needed to go deeper into those mechanisms. So is this clear? I'm going to put my fingers on two separate parts of my brain. They're not the actual anatomical sites. But let's say this is left. This is left. Left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this is right anterior insula somewhere over here. They are talking to each other. And normally they are anti-correlated, that is one goes up, other goes down, and vice versa, or they are uncorrelated, that means they are just independently working. But if they become positive correlated, they both get tied up with each other's function, then the patient dep develops depression. So if you see here, people with MDD, major uh, depression, the depressive disorder, show increased positive, positive connectivity between the ECN and DMN, executive, central executive network, CEN, and DMN is the um, default mode network. Now, default mode network, over here, if you are neurologist, for example, you're going to challenge me here and say, hey, you're talking about right anterior insula, which is part of the salience network, and here they're talking about default mode network. Why the heck are you connecting these two? So here, the executive network, this guy, and the salience network, this guy, are connected with the default mode network as well. And interestingly, the brokerage of the interaction between these two, let's say this is the default mode network, A, and the central executive network, B, the brokerage of communication between these two is done by the salience network. It is their middleman. So when salience network isn't working correctly, then the default mode network and the executive network do not work correctly and the patient end up in depression. So this communication is important. This is their middleman. Okay, so now, this is gonna be an important one. So, uh, one more, this is the last important concept. So bear with me. This is the central executive network, not the whole of it. This is part of the a key node in the central executive network, right? The, the left 
dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is part of the salius network, right anterior insula. They observed something very interesting. Imagine, let's do a quick math. Imagine that they are observing these two structures talking with each other. So imagine they put the patient in the machine and in the functional uh, resonance imaging. And they are measuring the brain's oxygen utility, which tells the activity of the tissue over time. They're taking slices by time. And imagine that this tissue becomes active and then this becomes active. Meaning the, this tissue is sending impulses to this one. And in some people, this tissue becomes active and then this becomes active. That means this is sending impulses on in this direction. They saw that, so imagine now we have right anterior insula. So let's do math, right anterior insula, the number of activities minus left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity. So let's say this guy sent one, two, three, four, four impulses. And this guy sent two impulses. So four minus two equals plus two. So they called it positive baseline or positive correlation. Now imagine if this guy sent four, but this guy in response sent five. So then four minus five equals minus one. That is a negative correlation. Similarly, let's say in another patient, this guy is sending four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten impulses. And this one, the central executive net network key node is sending one, two, three, four, five. So now we have 10 minus five, which is plus five. So plus five is more than plus two. So then you are seeing three states of their connection. Very positive, less positive, and negative. Now, can I say whenever it is positive, that means this structure is dominant because it is sending more impulses. And whenever it is negative, then this structure is dominant because it is sending more impulses. They found out that when right insula, right anterior insula is dominant, then patient has depression. But when this structure is dominant, then patient doesn't have depression. And they also found that when they were doing transcranial magnetic stimulation, those patients that had a smaller positive number, that means let's say one, two, three, four from here and one, two, three from here. So the four minus three equals plus one. Those who had a smaller positive number, that means this structure was less dominant. It was dominant, but less dominant. They started feeling better even at 16 week. And those who did not respond, they had this structure much more dominant. It was sending, let's say, 10 impulses versus two from here, and it was plus eight difference. And such patients did not, did not respond. That's, that's an amazing discovery that they did. So if you see here, we found that the imbalance of influence between right anterior insula and IDL PFC net outflow, meaning you sum them up and see what is the net outflow. Is it towards here or towards here? Predicted, predicted improvement in depression symptoms over 26 weeks across the groups. So if somebody had this treatment and they did not respond very well, one of the reason was that this structure was so dominant that even the uh, resonance did not help it go back and modulate back towards normalcy. 
reduced baseline net outflow. Reduced baseline net outflow means one, two, three, four here, one, two, three here. So the baseline outflow is plus one compared to plus nine or plus 10. Reduced baseline net outflow from right interior insula to this was associated with responses at 16 weeks. So those who started with less dominant insula, but still dominant, so they had depression, but they started improving fast. Post hoc analysis, so after the test, they did analysis again, or after doing the study analysis, post hoc analysis suggested that improvement in core symptoms of depression was associated with dominant baseline effective connectivity from the IDL PFC on the RAI. Those who had better outcomes, that were the one in which this structure was more dominantly influencing this structure. And fortunately, in some patient, even when this balance was out, when they did the resonance, that created balance back here. That is how they improved the patient. A putative, again, a presumed and assumed mechanism, a thought that, hey, we think this is what's happening. A putative mechanistic explanation requiring further research is that greater influence of ideal P. FC, this guy, on RAI, this guy, might enable the effect of TMS to spread more effectively from IDL to LDL to RAI, thereby enhancing the neuromodulatory effect. So they're saying if we send more impulses here by resonance methods, somehow it seems like this would control the other one better, the the resonance would spread from here to the other tissues better. That is why this may be an important thing. If this is dominant, it is probably connected better. And so if you give it resonance, then it can control this area better. That is what they were looking at. Again, this is putative. This is assumed. This is presumed. They're just thinking that it is this way. So in summary, if you said, give me one diagram to summate, summate this whole thing. If we have a central executive network tissue, which is not dominant, but the insular, insula is dominant. If you then do resonance and make this dominant or reduce the dominance of this insular tissue, then the, the negative correlation or unrelated, uncorrelated structure gets established and depression gets managed. So in conclusion, this is the last part now. In conclusion, this study found that CGI TBS and MRI neuronavigatory nav navigated RTMS are equally effective and safe. Patients showed clinically substantial improvement in depression that were sustained up to 26 weeks. These findings raise the possibility that some treatment-resistant depression patients unresponsive to other treatments could be kept well, while many others would derive clinically significant benefit from one or two MRI-navigated courses of 20 or possibly more within a year. So that is the discussion. Um, really interesting and I enjoyed that they were looking at the mechanism as well and as much as they could not prove the efficacy of the new system to be better than the previous but that is actually a good news that they both are efficacious equally efficacious and safe and are able to help um, major depressive disorder patients. So this is the discussion please uh, do me a favor prevent me from depression by sharing, <laughs> subscribing, and liking this video. And if you would like to have more lectures, drbean.com, the link is in the description. If you would like to support this work as well, the links are in the description and the link in the description for this study as well. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now.